hello everybody. Welcome to Security 101. I'm Matt. I work on uh, Chrome platform security. Um, and yeah, uh, the slide deck I'm using today uh, was originally uh, created by Emily Stark and Chris Palmer uh, and extended by Carlos Ibarra Lopez. So thanks uh, very much. So let's get right into it. So uh, yeah, this is our outline. First, we're going to go over some general security principles. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you about the security architecture and the guiding principles of Chromium um, and give you a quick overview of the security team and what it's like to work with us. Um, and hopefully you have the link to ask questions. Uh, I'll try to get to them at the end, or if I see them while I'm presenting, I'll try to answer them as soon as possible. Um, and let's go back to this first slide. My, my email is mpdenton at chromium.org. So if you do have any questions, you want to email me about something, uh, feel free. Um, yep. So let's jump right into it. Uh, just some quick general security principles. Um, when you trust an entity, that means it can break your, uh, um, your security expectations. And so a security mechanism must do one of those three things uh, at the bottom there. It has to either reduce the number of entities you trust, or it has to reduce to reduce the degree to which you trust those entities, or it has to establish the trustworthiness of those entities. Um, and a, just a general definition of security, um, the system behaves correctly uh, the way its stakeholders expect, even under active sabotage. So basically, it's not enough to be correct when a website is behaving normally. We have to be correct even when a website is actively trying to trigger bugs and sabotages. So we have a lot of fun on Chrome security. Um, and the important part here is that uh, for Chromium security, there, there are multiple stakeholders. There are users, authors, implementers, specifiers. Uh, and the most important one by far is the users. And obviously, our, our goal is to establish uh, the most trustworthy implementation of the open web platform. So let's jump right into the web security model. So the web security model is, is actually pretty crazy because it aims to enable you to visit any web page, even one under the control of an evil attacker, and run whatever HTML, CSS, JavaScript, WebAssembly, whatever they give you, all without giving it more power or capabilities than the user wants to have. And once you navigate away or close the tab, uh, the attacker should not be able to persist on your computer. So basically, each website shouldn't be able to uh, influence anything beyond its own resources and those you explicitly give it. Um, and they shouldn't be able to access the data of separate websites. Um, so this whole model is exactly what makes uh, the web so awesome and also what makes Chromium security so challenging. Um, so how does the web manage this feat? Um, the fact that the code is managed is, is one big part of it. JavaScript is not arbitrary machine code, neither is HTML and CSS. Um, in fact, JavaScript is garbage collected and it's not supposed to have memory corruption bugs. Um, so that does make it a lot easier. So the, the cornerstone of, of the web security model is known as the same origin policy. And it's basically just a form of isolation between websites. So uh, evil.com and dominoes.com should not be able to access each other's data. So um, dominoes.com has some client side state, like say like your unfinished pizza order that you're, you know, you're currently ordering. Uh, might have some service side resources like ability to order a pizza or your list of previous orders. Um, and it might have some client side permissions. Like for example, if you for some reason gave Domino's your location, your geolocation in order to order a pizza right to your location at any time. Um, it has those two and evil.com should not be able to access your location just because Domino's.com has access to it. Um, and shouldn't be able to at, order a pizza on your behalf or order a pizza itself um, or access your, your current pizza order. Um, and vice versa, dominoes.com shouldn't be able to access uh, evil.com's data. Um, and it is, it's helpful to, to define exactly what an origin is. Um, it's just basically a tuple of the scheme host and a port. Uh, so, um, if you look at that first example, uh, www.google.com, the hosts are the same, um, but one is over HTTP, which is unencrypted, and one is over HTTPS, which is encrypted. Um, 
and those two websites can't, sorry, those two origins can't access each other's data um, because one is HTTP and one, one is HTTPS. Uh, and if you look at the third example, um, www.google.com and mail.google.com are also not the same. So they can't access each other's data either without um, explicit permission. Um, so another important part of the web is that uh, your packets go over a lot of very uh, untrusted hops on the way to their destination. So if you're sitting on Starbucks Wi-Fi, uh, you have to assume, for example, that everybody else on the network is, can read your packets. Um, or, and we call that a passive network attacker, uh, which basically means that um, passive network attacker is sitting on the network and can read all of your packets. Um, so that could also include like a compromised ISP um, or somebody that's tapped into your ISP's cables. Um, and so then there's also another type of network attacker called an active network attacker. And an active network attacker can actually alter anything, alter any of your packets. Um, and so that would include like, you know, the person sitting at Starbucks that set, set up a router uh, underneath the table and you accidentally connect to it because it has a stronger connection than Starbucks Wi-Fi, um, they can pretty much alter anything that you, uh, that you send. And we have to, we basically have to assume that those kind of network attackers are always present because empirically they are. Um, so we need transport security. We need end-to-end uh, -end encryption type thing. Um, so some URL schemes like HTTPS and WSS, they use what's called transport layer security, which is normally um, abbreviated as TLS and used to be known as SSL. So you'll probably see both acronyms a lot. Um, and they provide three important security benefits. Um, first is data confidentiality, which basically means uh, with the data when it's sent over the network is encrypted um, and it's just the attacker sitting on the network can only see ciphertext. It looks like random data to them. Uh, the second is data integrity. Um, and that basically means that uh, an attacker, an active network attacker sitting on the network can't modify your data in transit. Even if they don't want to know what it is, they still can't modify it. Um, and the last one is, is server authentication. Um, and server authentication is probably the most important one Basically, like if, if you are talking to secure.example.com, how do you know it's actually secure.example.com that can decrypt the data? Because um, obviously somebody has to be able to decrypt it um, and you have to make sure that it is secure.example.com and not somebody else. So that's what server authentication is. So how do TLS and the web infrastructure provide this transport security? So to get some clues, let's take a look at DevTools and we're on the security panel in DevTools and you can see it says, uh, this page is secure. We're using valid HTTPS. And under that, you can say um, the certificate is valid and trusted. Um, so let's view the certificate. When you click on view certificate, you get a view of the certificate the server sent you. Um, and a certificate is basically a data structure that includes some useful information. So first of all, you can see we've, we've browsed paypal.com. And they've sent us a certificate that it says is issued to www.paypal.com. Um, and what the certificate includes is it includes a public key for paypal.com. And this public key can, can be used by your browser to encrypt data such that only the private key for paypal.com can be used to decrypt it. And hopefully only PayPal has, has uh, PayPal's private key. Um, and so all this sounds pretty good. Um, but how do you know exactly that this is actually paypal.com's public key? Like, uh, how do you know that you didn't try to connect to paypal.com and some active network attacker sent down a fraudulent certificate that said paypal.com, it's issued to paypal.com, but actually included the attacker's public key? Uh, and the answer to that is um, the certificate also needs to include a cryptographic signature that proves that somebody else you already trust believes the certificate certificate hasn't been tampered with and actually contains the public key for paypal.com. So that obviously raises the question, who do you already trust? Um, and it's basically a list. Your OS provides a list of people 
that you already trust, and they're called the Certificate Authorities, which we abbreviate as CA. Um, and you can see uh, in this screenshot that um, the certificate was issued by DigiCert. So DigiCert is a CA, and your, your operating system uh, by default trusts DigiCert to issue certificates for any site on the internet. Um, and the operators of DigiCert trust the operators of PayPal.com. Um, so there's kind of an issue with this uh, that does come up from time to time. Um, if, uh, if a CA gets compromised or if they're misbehaving or they make a mistake or they get tricked in, in, into issuing a fraudulent certificate, um, then uh, uh, an active network attacker might be able to take advantage of that. Um, so, and, and, you know, sometimes your platform vendor might prove untrustworthy and include a malicious uh, uh, public key, malicious, excuse me, a malicious certificate in the platform. Um, and this does come up, like it, it, it really does. There are plenty of um, news articles about it. You can take a look. Um, and so one approach to the problem that was invented at Google is to have browsers require that all issuance occurs in public view. Um, and that way, an attacker that tries to take advantage of a CA can't help but at least create an audit trail. Um, and we call that uh, the system certificate transparency. Um, and the goal is to make sure that uh, there's an audit trail and then that if a certificate is misissued, um, uh, that we can revoke it quickly. Um, so basically, how, how certificate transparency works is whenever a CA uh, issues a certificate, basically signs a certificate, um, they have to include it in an audit log. And that audit log is public and it's cryptographically verified to be append only. So you can't delete anything out of this log. Um, and then when PayPal.com sends down its certificate, uh, it has to include a proof that it was included in an append only CT log, a certificate transparency log. And that way we know that it has been logged uh, and then there is an audit trail for this certificate. And it's not just some, uh, you know, some fraudulent certificate for paypal.com that was signed by a rogue CA. Um, and so what does this mean for you as a Chromium engineer? Uh, it basically means that if you're building a new web platform feature, you need to consider how a network attacker might abuse it. And you should consider making it available only to HTTPS sites. In fact, this is a Chromium policy that certain features classified as powerful should be limited to secure sites only to protect our users. So if a user gives HTTP dominoes.com, unencrypted HTTP, access to their geolocation, then anytime uh, dominoes.com is loaded over HTTP, an active network attacker could insert a script into dominoes.com uh, that sends your location anywhere, like, like evil.com or uh, God forbid, papajohns.com. Um, and it's also vulnerable to passive network attackers, since if your geolocation is being broadcasted over the internet in the clear, any passive network attacker can just read it. So just keep this policy in mind. Yes, you can see here, this is the site settings of neverssl.com, which is always unencrypted, always over HTTP. And you can see that most of the powerful things there, like location, camera, microphone, uh, they're all blocked and they're permanently blocked. They can't be unblocked. Um, so obviously for this reason, Chromium was always intensely invested in the adoption of HTTPS across the web. And that's really a large ecosystem wide project and we've built developer tools and browser UI and analysis tools to tackle this problem. Uh, and obviously you can see from the graph, it's, it's up and to the right. The uh, usage keeps going up. Um, and it really is kind of crazy to think that back in 2015, less than 50% of pages loaded are over HTTPS, but we've come a long way since then. Cool, so uh, moving on from the web security model at large and on to Chromium the browser. So we have to enforce this ambitious security model and that requires defense in depth. Um, Chromium is millions of lines of C++ code uh, and we have to assume there are bugs in the way the browser parses, runs, and, and renders websites. For example, the JavaScript engine might have a bug that allows uh, 
one window from one site to control the window of another site, even though that shouldn't be allowed. Um, or the HTML parser might have a typical uh, memory corruption vulnerability, like a buffer overflow, uh, so that a malicious site can serve HTML that triggers that vulnerability and allows the site to actually execute arbitrary native code in the HTML parser's process instead of just JavaScript or WebAssembly. Um, so Chromium limits the impact of bugs like that by process isolation and sandboxing. Um, and you might've see might seen a diagram like this in other talks. Um, Chromium is actually made up of many OS level processes. So web content like HTML and JavaScript is parsed, interpreted, and, and rendered in untrusted render processes over on the left there, um, which are spawned by a fully privileged uh, browser process, um, which is in the middle there. Um, and the browser process manages basically access to all the things on the right, all the resources on the right, like your file system, your OS, a OS APIs, and uh, your geolocation, and, and uh, uh, your camera and your microphone. Um, so yeah, so how do we make sure that the untrusted render process over there can't access those resources on the right? Because they're just normal OS uh, processes, right? Um, so the answer is we use OS APIs to lower the privilege level of these processes and to prevent them from doing things like, uh, like you know, everything on the right, installing software, reading arbitrary files, making arbitrary network requests, accessing your location. Um, and this technique is called privilege re reduction or sandboxing, um, which is pretty foundational. Um, so a bug that allows malicious web contents to take over a render and run native code in one of those renders on the left um, it, it'll have less direct power because to access resources um, outside the effective boundaries of the sandbox, uh, that would, or would require the attacker to exploit a completely separate bug, which is a big deal because finding bugs is not extremely easy in Chromium. Uh, so requiring the attacker to f uh, find a couple extra bugs makes a big deal. Um, so yeah, it's important to note that the trusted browser process in the middle there is not sandboxed. And so you have to be careful uh, with what you do in the browser process, because it, it has full privilege and it has full access to everything on the right there. Um, so uh, it's important to put any attack surface, basically any code that handles untrusted input from the web, um, you need to put that in the render process if possible or in another sandbox process. So what renders are allowed to do, because sometimes they have to access the resources on the right, uh, but in a secure way, um, renders are allowed to send and receive messages to the, pro to the browser process. And that's called inter-process communication, or IPC for short, which is probably an acronym you're going to see all the time. Um, and using IPC, uh, renders can ask the browser process to access those things on the right, um, like access the network or user camera. And this means that the browser needs to verify that the render has permission to do those things, like maybe showing a UI that asks the, that user if dominoes.com should have access to your location, or if you've already given dominoes.com this power in another browsing session, the power should just grant access automatically. Um, and while working on Chromium, you're probably going to add or modify uh, IPC interfaces all the time. And so reviewing those things is pretty crucial for Chromium security. Also, if you've if you just a side note, if you've ever done uh, OS security before, you'll you'll recognize this model. Like uh, the browser process in the middle is the kernel; it has access to all the hardware resources on the right. Uh, the untrusted render processes on the left are like user processes, uh, and the IPC methods are basically like syscalls. Um, an important part of this multi-process model is called site isolation, which is available on most platforms, um, all desktop platforms. And it keeps separate sites in different processes uh, so they can't access each other's data, uh, whether via bug in our code or even a CPU vulnerability. Um, so you can see in the diagram like this first untrusted render process is locked to google.com and the bottom was locked to evil.com, which means that anything, um, any web page uh, from evil.com is not going to be uh, parsed and rendered and run in the render for google.com. So that means uh, if the attacker uh, uh, from evil.com exploits uh, some bug in the JavaScript engine and takes over its process, uh, data from google.com is not allowed to be in that render process. 
Um, and so it's just a form of isolation between websites. Um, and this is unavailable on some Android systems because it requires more OS processes, uh, which requires more memory um, and it's a little slower. Um, and it's, it's, it's a little less important on some low-end Android devices because some CPU bugs don't exist there. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to give an example of an IPC interface uh, running in the browser uh, that has a flawed implementation that at first glance might seem safe. Um, so the privileged browser process on the left, on the left here, uh, it might provide this IPC method called access cookie. Um, because a render running JavaScript might want access to its cookie. Um, and uh, the cookie is probably stored on disk somewhere. So it can't, the render can't have direct access to that file or to, to disk at all. Um, so we might have an IPC method called say um, access cookie and it takes uh, the render's origin and it returns the cookie data. And the implementation is pretty simple. It's just uh, look at the cookie data for the origin um, on the file system somewhere and then send that cookie data back to the render. And that all, all happens over IPC. And so on the right, we have a render for google.com um, and it's uncompromised, but it's behaving correctly. And whenever say JavaScript uh, uh, wants to access the cookie, um, some C++ on behalf of the JavaScript is gonna, is gonna call access cookie and it's gonna include its, its origin, which is google.com. And that seems like it's working correctly, right? But is it? Um, so now we have a render for evil.com and it's compromised via memory unsafety error. So now the attacker is running uh, arbitrary native code in that OS process. Um, and so they can call whatever IPC they want with whatever data they want in whatever the order they want. And so in this case, they can call access cookie for paypal.com and they get a cookie or access uh, cookie for google.com or maybe they want to order a pizza and they can access the cookie for Domino's.com. So we have to add a fix here. Um, and it's pretty simple. Basically like at the beginning of this IPC implementation, uh, the first thing we do is just check, is the render allowed to access data for the origin? And if not, just bail out. Um, and so when the evil.com render tries to access the cookie for paypal.com, it just gets nothing back. Um, an even better fix really would be uh, just don't take the origin as a parameter at all to this IPC method because uh, the IPC interface implementation should already know what the origin uh, is of um, that specific render. It should just already know it's evil.com. Um, and it should, uh, and then it just does the check. So that, that this kind of example really comes up a lot uh, in, in security reviews. So it's, it, things like that are, are pretty common uh, and you have to keep track of it and you have to always realize that IPC methods can be called with any arbitrary data from a compromised render and they can call, be called in any order. So like if you have, for example, an initialize method on your IPC and you always expect initialize to be called before everything else or you expect it to only be called once, that's not quite true. Um, you can't always guarantee that because if a render gets compromised, it can send whatever IPCs it wants. And so you can send, it can send initialize twice or it can forget to send initialize at all. Um, so you always have to deal with that. So, th and that's pretty tricky and pretty annoying, um, but we're here to help as the security team. Um, and yeah, okay. So C++ is pretty dangerous. It's a memory unsafe language, which means it's really easy to write memory corruption bugs. And you'll hear that all the time, that C++ is pretty dangerous. Um, Cause uh, like I'd say when Chromium started, C++ is, was probably the only viable language to write a, well, excuse me, to write a web browser in. Um, and that's probably not true anymore, but we have so much C++ that we can't kind of can't really get away from it. Um, so we, we try to proactively find uh, and fix bugs. And one of the most efficient methods um, for finding bugs is called fuzzing, which is basically throwing all sorts of randomly generated test cases at Chromium and, and looking for crashes in memory corruption and uh, failed assertions. And that's actually the topic for the next talk, uh, fuzzing 101. It's a great talk, so you should definitely go. It's a lot of fun. Um, so I'm not going to talk about it too much right now. It's important to note that security bugs are not the same as normal stability bugs. So 
if a non-security bug is not a recent regression and has been unstable for a while, it, it, there's like a valid argument that maybe we can live for, with it for one more release. Um, and that's not true with security bugs because while that bug is unstable, um, the longer our users are vulnerable and the longer it's in the code, perhaps the more likely it is to be found by an attacker. Um, we really harp on about this, like crash metrics, are, they don't matter for judging the severity of the security bug. Um, it doesn't matter like if it's, if it's only happened two times in the wild, if you've only encountered this bug two times, because we have to be correct under active sabotage, uh, which means um, an attacker could, could make that bug happen, uh, even if a normal uh, well-behaving website doesn't make that bug happen very often. Um, and sometimes, yet yeah, sometimes bugs are reported by external reporters and we pay these external reporters rewards. Um, and we do offer large uh, reward amounts for high quality reports. So you can feel free to ask for more on a security bug if you're assigned to fix a security bug. Um, so if you can't re reproduce it or it's too confusing, um, or even if you need like opinions on how to fix it, uh, you can go ahead and ask uh, that reporter because we do pay them more if they give high quality reports. Um, and that last bullet point there, we should prioritize merging as soon as possible. Um, Cause we, we are constantly attacked. Um, um, and in fact, when you start developing a fix in public, uh, it's, it's it tends to be pretty clear what the vulnerability is. And we do know that attackers scan uh, changes that are uploaded to Garrett uh, and normally when you upload a fix to Garrett, um, you include a bug number. And if you click on the bug and it's a security bug, um, then it's gonna be restricted access. <clears throat> and so it, a lot of attackers will scan Garrett fixes um, that have bug numbers that are restricted. And so then they can go look at that fix and they can reverse engineer the bug and they, they can start writing their exploit uh, as soon as you upload that fix. So we have to prioritize merging as soon as possible because it, it becomes public very quickly. Um, and that that uh, particular subject is uh, the subject of our life of, life of a vulnerability talk, which is coming up right after the buzzing talk. So um, it's definitely a lot of fun, really interesting. So definitely go. So even if we have perfect code, with zero bugs, perfect enforcement of web platform security features, um, sad reality is that it's still really easy for users to get tricked on the web, uh, and all the work I've described uh, doesn't doesn't protect Chromium users if they get tricked into giving up sensitive data or credentials or privileges. Um, so this example on the screen here is a phishing email, in which the user clicks the link and enters their Gmail password, uh, thinking it's a legitimate Google password change, but they're actually on an evil site, um, which is harvesting their password to log in as them. Um, so we have a, a feature called safe browsing uh, that, among other things, tries to detect, detect phishing. And we have a UI that attempts to keep users safe whenever possible and clearly communicate the risks. So we do extensive research when implementing security UI or changing existing ones to make sure we are providing the right information to users and to make sure our opinionated UI is having the effect that we expect. Uh, so if you're interested in the quantitative research that we do, um, around security UI and how users, users understand it. Um, Emily Stark's website has a lot of that. Um, so you can go to emilymstark.com, uh, lots of cool stuff there. And also it's important that the UI is always accurately reflecting what's going on so the user can make informed decisions. Uh, for example, if the Omnibox displays google.com, the website being displayed better actually be google.com and not evil.com, or the user might enter their Google username and password into evil.com. So this is a now public example of a URL bar spoof from an external bug reporter, uh, which we paid a reward for, um, in which the URL bar shows google.com um, when it shouldn't due to a logic bug. So let's watch it. It goes kind of fast. The website uh, tricks you into clicking on the Omnibox you do, and it says you're being redirected to google.com. So you click OK, and the Omnibox says google.com but is it google.com? So we go in and out full screen and you can see the Omnibox no longer says google.com. Um, so that's a spoof. Uh, it said google.com at the top and it really shouldn't have. 
um, because we weren't on google.com. Um, so that's an issue. We have one more example uh, from the, uh, the same reporter actually, um, where our permissions dialogue is hidden uh, by something the website created. Um, we'll see in just a second. Uh, so it looks like this website is showing you a click OK to accept our terms of service, uh, which users are, are pretty conditioned to just click OK on. But underneath this is actually a permissions dialog that is asking to access your camera and your microphone and your location. And so the user did not provide informed consent to share those powerful features with the website. <clears throat> so that's uh, most everything with uh, security models. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about what it's like to work with a Chromium security team. That's me, that's us. Uh, the security team, this is a smattering of the teams. There are a ton of teams and we all work in a lot of very disparate areas of security. Um, so I work, I didn't mention this in the beginning, this is very early, uh, but I work on platform security, which is uh, designing for defense in depth which is, I basically work on the sandboxing part, the privilege reduction part a lot. Um, <clears throat> and we overlap a bit with the security architecture team, which is the high level kind of multi-process architecture. Um, there's the bugs minus minus team, which is like the buzzing team. Um, there's the enamel team, which works on security UI uh, and does a lot of the, the research into uh, checking that users are responding to UI correctly. Um, Open web platform security, uh, which is kind of uh, same origin policy uh, sort of domain. And then there's safe browsing, um, which is like, uh, you know, uh, uh, protecting users from phishing, trying to detect phishing among, among other things. Um, this is not all of our teams. Like we have other ones uh, and you'll have opportunities to work with all of us. And we're pretty friendly uh, and we want you to not be blocked on us ever. Um, so you should definitely reach out whenever you want. Uh, you can ask security questions if you're confused about something. Um, so one way in which you might often interact with us is when you write IPC code. So IPC messages can be dangerous, uh, like I said earlier, because because they can cause an unsandboxed process like the browser um, to take advantage. Uh, excuse me, to take action uh, on behalf of an untrusted rendered process or uh, just an, another uh, untrusted process, any sandbox process. And so these require security review. Um, and they're just like any other code review, except we might have a little less context than a normal owner's code review. Um, it's much faster if, if you provide context, like if, if I'm assigned to a review and I don't even know what the feature is when I start reviewing, it's gonna take a little while longer and I don't want you to be blocked uh, on, on me. Um, so please just, you know, provide a little context, add us to the view uh, pretty early, um, and expect it to be thorough and not a rubber stamp. <clears throat> so you probably already know from other talks that a, a security view is part of launching a feature in Chromium. So make sure you include a security considerations doc in, uh, in your design doc. Um, and reach out early, because there might be many rounds of review for complex projects, and that's fine. Um, and that last bullet point there, if you think there's no way to implement what you're working on without adding risk, uh, just, yeah, just talk to us because we might be able to provide suggestions. We're used to that kind of thing. We try to be yes people instead of no people. Um, we want to watch features. We want to make the web cool uh, and we're nice. So go ahead and talk to us. This is uh, an example of the things we're looking for in security reviews. Um, we obviously want to make sure that users can give informed consent, uh, that they understand the UI. We're looking for any new, new risks that are introduced. Um, we're looking to make sure you're using encryption and secure transport. Um, we're, we're trying to make sure that you're using good testing, like unit, both unit and integration testing, because um, good testing is the bedrock of uh, good code, uh, and good code is the bedrock of, of good security. So um, we try to make sure you have good tests. Um, and if you're writing a new parser or something, we're going to require a fuzzer um, or even a new IPC interface. It's probably best if you write a new fuzzer for it. Um, 
because you're probably writing in C++ and that's a very dangerous language. Um, and, you know, so yeah, the, the, the rule of two at the bottom here, um, it's kind of platform, platform securities thing. Um, you're pretty much always going to be programming in C++. It's, you know, it's a, it's a memory unsafe language and uh, it's very easy to cause memory corruption, uh, especially when you're parsing untrustworthy inputs, that second bullet point there. Um, and so if you're parsing untrustworthy inputs in a memory unsafe language, you have to assume that an attacker is going to be able to take over whatever process that code is running in. So if that process is running at high privilege, um, then that's kind of an issue um, because the attacker, when they take over the process, they're going to have high privilege too. Um, so the rule of two is you can pick a max of a memory unsafe language, parsing untrustworthy inputs, or high privilege, and you're pretty much always going to have those first two. So the easiest way to uh, comply with the rule of two is to basically sandbox your code, um, which which you can do by pretty much just putting in a render process. And sometimes that's not possible, and we can sand we can work on the sandbox together. Um, so just reach out if you're confused about sandboxing your code. And that's it. Yep. Cool. So just uh, any questions? I didn't. I don't think I saw any. Cool. Okay. Uh, yeah, my email is mpdenton at chromium.org. Uh, and you can also email security at chromium.org. I think that was in the slide somewhere. If you have any questions about security or anything uh, that I talked about. So, cool.